of Mark chapter 16, starting with verse 1, verse 1 to 8. Let us pray. Lord, as we read your word this morning, we want our hearts that your word may be planted there and it may grow good fruit for you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples, and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone, because they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. Two short jokes. I had a nightmare last night that an evil queen had forced me to eat a marshmallow. And when I woke this morning, I had a stomach ache and my pillow was gone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Siri is the voice on the phone that answers questions. You know, you ask Siri, Siri, and that's the question that it answers. So a man asked Siri, Siri, why am I still single? And Siri activated the camera. <laughs> oh. Jokes are, are often funny because their endings are unexpected. You know, when, when you say something unexpected, it kind of short circuits the brain uh, and causes the brain, which is expecting something normal to be jostled for a moment. And when you realize it's not something dangerous, you laugh. And that's kind of the way that uh, rides work in amusement parks, too. You know, it's kind of dangerous. And it's unexpected. You don't normally hang upside down on a roller coaster. Uh, but, you know, you realize it should be safe, and so you laugh. Uh, and so in this case, you do that. But sometimes, you know, of course, with unexpected things, the unexpected things can uh, cause us to be wary or to be afraid or to be confused, depending on what the event is. And whatever happens, though, um, the, the reaction uh, is stirred. And that reaction to the unexpected causes us to, to think about what has happened, uh, what the meaning of it is. And something similar is going on here in the Gospel of Mark. Now, each book of the Bible is amazing in its own way, and Mark is no exception. Now, I think you all are starting to study Mark, are you not? Yes. Uh, and so I'll talk about it a little bit this morning from some things I've learned. Um, the scholars believe, for a whole host of reasons, uh, that the Gospel of Mark was the very first gospel that was written. Uh, it's one of the three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that are called synoptic gospels because they are very similar to each other. Uh, and so they're so similar, uh, you know, John is really kind of a different animal altogether, but these three are so similar uh, that when you read them, they figured out that Matthew contains almost verbatim some 90% of the verses found in Mark. And Luke contains almost verbatim some 50% of the verses found in Mark. And so scholars have conjectured from that that Mark was one of the sources that Matthew and Luke used when they wrote their own Gospels. And of course they fleshed it out with other things they found. Uh, so Mark was one of the first ones written. It's also the shortest Gospel. And it's written in simple language. It was written in kind of pidgin Greek of the day, called Koine Greek, common Greek. It wasn't the, the Greek spoken by the sages and philosophers and scholars. It was the, the language spoken by common people, dock workers, laborers, housewives, and such, so that everyone could understand it. And it's written in an explosive manner. There's no punctuation. Everything runs from one to the other, with connecting words in between, almost in a breathless manner. You know, Jesus and the disciples were here, and then they did this, and then they went over here, and then after that they went over here and did this, and then this happened, and then over here, you know, it's just like, straight through. If you tried to stop at punctuation, you'd read the whole thing. You wouldn't run across it. And so it seems very breathless. And Mark begins not with the birth of Jesus or any part of it, but rather with the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist. Um, 
kind of at the start of his ministry. It's almost as if the listener, because if you remember the early church, you know, printing wasn't uh, available in those days. You had to copy things by hand. And so the copies they had, they had few and far between, and they would have been very expensive. So most people would have listened and heard these things rather than read it themselves. So it's almost as if the listener, in reading the gospel or hearing the gospel of Mark, has had Christ drop into the middle of their lives, just like the disciples must have. The disciples were older people. They had lived for a while, uh, and then Jesus explodes into their lives. And it kind of happens that way with the gospel of Mark, not with Christ's birth, but with the beginning of his ministry and the calling of his disciples. And then the ending of Mark is also not what we might expect. Most of the oldest manuscripts that we have found, which means they're closer to the originals that were written, most of them that we have found in the Gospel of Mark do not include anything after verse 8. Verse 8 that we read this morning is about the women fleeing from the tomb uh, in fear and trembling, not saying anything to anybody, uh, which seems kind of strange to us. They would stop there. The other verses were added later, uh, which kind of flesh out what happened with the resurrection. Now, of course, we realize that the early Christians knew about the resurrection. They would have known that before they joined the church altogether. But why would the gospel have been written to stop at that particular point that we read this morning? Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question. But if you think about it, you know, at the point where they flee from the tomb, the unexpected has happened. Jesus is not dead as they expected him to be. Dead bodies stay in graves. But Jesus is gone. The body is not there. And an odd being in white has told them to go ahead to Galilee. Now notice too, the scripture doesn't say that this being is an angel. We read in other gospels that it is. And I think the early Christians would have made the connection. But it's spoken as if you happened upon the tomb and there's this person in white there that tells you that Jesus is not there and has gone ahead and look in the tomb, it's empty. Where is the body gone? Well, Christ has gone ahead of you just as he told you earlier in that gospel that he was going to do. And so the unexpected has happened. And you have to ask yourself, before you say much about the folks that fled from the tomb here, what would happen and what would your response be if you found yourself in that situation? You went to visit a grave of a loved one, and you were met there by a being in white that told you that the grave was empty, the person was alive, and that they were ahead to meet you on in another place on up the road. I think you would at least be concerned and confused, and you would probably have some conflicting emotions, maybe dread about what happened, maybe confusion as to what's going on, might be angry, maybe thinking somebody's played a joke on you, or somebody's stolen the body, and no doubt you would have a little hope and wonder in your heart that it might just be true, that the one that you love is alive, and that you'll see them again here in this life. Now if you add to that all that Jesus was and is to his Father, Messiah, Lord, Healer, Savior, teacher, promiser, king, add that to the mix. You know, all this person meant to them, all the hopes that they wrapped up in Jesus, and I think that you can see the hope that would well up in them that, yes, if he is alive, then all these wonderful things that have happened in the past two or three years of his ministry have not been a fluke. They're not over. What he said is true. Who we thought he is is true. But I think upon initially coming upon the empty tomb, I think I probably would have run away as well. I probably would have put some distance between me and there in order to collect my thoughts and puzzle out what's happened here. And this is where the original gospel ends. We've got to remember that the earliest Christians, maybe for the first 300 years or so, which is longer than America's been a nation, uh, Christians did not have what we call the New Testament today. Their assemblies would have had a copy of the Old Testament, which would have been the Hebrew Scriptures, they knew that. But of the New Testament, they would have had just bits and pieces starting out. Maybe a gospel, maybe a couple letters from Paul, and that's what they had, as well as the witness that had been given to their earliest founders. Of course, over time, they would have collected more as people passed through and letters switched hands and were copied, and, and eventually, the canon of the New Testament, we know it was collected, but initially, Gospel of Mark may have been the only gospel some of those early Christians had. And like I say, they would have known about the resurrection. But if you think about the reading of the Gospel of Mark, as I've described it this morning, uh, you can see maybe the impact 
it would have on those early Christians. Explosive, to the point, fast-paced, miracle after miracle, teaching after teaching, many of them with Jesus admonishing them, be, you know, don't tell others about those miracles. It's called the Messianic Secrets. You see that a lot of Mark. Jesus tells them, you know, don't tell others about this. My time is not yet. But you are privy to the information, just as the early disciples were. And like those early disciples, you get to watch as Jesus heals people, as he works miracles, and then you see the horrors of him rejected and arrested, the unjust trials that he endured, the whippings and torment that he underwent, and then the crucifixion, the most horrible death a person could endure, which all these early Christians would have known well. They would have seen it before. And then feeling after reading through all of this and growing close to Jesus with what you hear, feeling like the disciples sad and confused, hopes dashed. Why would Jesus be rejected after all he had done? And then the listener has the final explosion happen in their hearts. Going to the tomb, the ladies find it empty, the being in white telling them that Jesus has risen from the dead and is not there but not on the head to Galilee to meet them. The listener then is just like those ladies, left in wonderment and asking the questions, what has happened here? What does this mean? And it's just like the listener has been with the disciples the whole time. Just like those disciples went with Jesus immediately after his baptism, so you would reading the Gospel of Mark. And just as they were left bereft, so would you be at the end. And then as they were left in wonder at Jesus' resurrection, so would you be. And you would have to ask yourself the question, your head spinning on Easter Sunday morning, what happened here? Where is Jesus? Who is that being and why? Is he an angel? Almost certainly. And the listener is left to decide at that moment, like the earliest disciples, what does Christ's resurrection mean for me? Having heard all I've heard, having seen all the disciples saw, how does it affect my life? And this is what it seeks for us to do, too, to have us ask those important questions. Those are questions we should ask on Easter Sunday morning, really every morning. What does Jesus' resurrection do for us? What impact does it make on our lives, or does it make an impact? Are we so used to hearing it that it really doesn't strike us anymore? But it should. It should be like those early Christians where it causes us to stop and wonder and think, what has God done here? What has the Lord done in raising Jesus from the dead? How does that impact my life? What does that mean? And then, in truth, we are the ones who finish the gospel. We talk about then how Jesus has touched our lives, how maybe he's appeared to us, what he's said to us, what he's commanded us to do, what he's called us to do, and how we live that out. We may not physically write it down, but our lives write the meaning of that gospel. For our lives and to what Jesus means for us. So we need to ask ourselves this morning, how is your story with Jesus written up to this moment? And how does it end? It's up to you. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your glorious resurrection. That you are risen from the dead, and that you have conquered sin and death and hell that you have saved us and called us together in a family, and that we have no need to fear anything anymore, our hand in yours. Lord, help the reality of the resurrection hit our lives, that every single day we have that explosive joy in our hearts as to what Jesus has done for us. And help us to share that with others around us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.